Please take a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our next session. We change once again the topic and uh, the next session deals with uh, cruise tourism, which actually since years is a success story. But nevertheless, there are some aspects that should be discussed critically and we already did that today when we were talking about over-tourism. So we will have uh, a moderator for that session, and that's uh, Thomas P. Illes. He is uh, a journalist and also a cruise tourism analyst. And I welcome you. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome to our session. Thank you. I have a very interesting, I would say, interesting high-ranking interview partner, as you have seen probably Mr. Kyriakos Anastasiadis, widely known as Kerry <laughs> in the industry, which simplifies things. So if I may, I will call you Kerry. Indeed, no problem. Welcome. Thank you very much. To Berlin. Great to be here. Um, yeah, success story. Cruise business is growing like crazy. We always have extremely phenomenal um, growth rates in this industry. The cruise business sometimes also saved uh, some struggling industries in the tourism. A lot of travel agents are keep, are keep saying that uh, luckily we had the cruise business. Because we have, of course, some geopolitical challenges, difficulties on one hand. And on the other hand, we have these growth rates, which uh, can provoke some criticism sometimes. Uh, how big is that going to, to be in five years, ten years? Can it continue like this? Over-tourism in cruise business is certainly also an issue. But let me first introduce Kerry. He's in a very interesting double role here. On one hand, he's the new chair of the Cruise Lines International Association Europe. So he's representing the majority of cruise lines. And on the other hand, he's at the same time, he's CEO of a very interesting cruise company called Celestial Cruises. Interesting because they don't have huge ships. They have smaller ships, whatever is called small today. <laughs> How much is your biggest ship? Our biggest ship has uh, 1,600 passengers. So 1,600 1, passengers today is called a small ship. It's already <laughs> telling a lot about the, the growth of the yes. industry. But the interesting thing is that he's also operating with his line uh, in, in, in Greece, in Turkey. And I think it will be interesting also to hear from him um, how, how is that going to, uh, to happen, how did it happen in the last uh, months, in the last years, how is it going to happen in the future. So this, this is why we are very happy to have you here. Thank you. And um, let's start, we have um, a real voting um, ability. There is one question, we did prepare for you? So maybe we just ask the technicians maybe to f show us the first question. Uh, do you have it also? Yeah, you have it also in English, exactly. Um, you don't. You, you didn't see the question first, no. yeah? No, I haven't seen them. So you see it here, yeah? Yes. More ships, bigger ships, yeah. What do you think? Is um, the cruise industry going to digest this? Or are we seeing very soon the limits? It can't get any bigger. What do you think? So if you think that, the, no, the oceans are big enough, no problem, we still can grow the next 10 years, press number one. If you think that ports are increasingly becoming the bottleneck of the whole system, number two. And if you think that, okay, yes, uh, we can't go on like this with this uh, crazy growth rates, number three. So I'm looking forward to see what, what you think.
Okay. Very clear res result, I would say. Interesting, it's only 11% thinking that the oceans are still wide enough. Probably the other ones, number two, number three, they know that the oceans is one thing, but uh, cruise ships are not only trading the oceans, they are going into ports and destinations. So, you have seen it very clearly that um, the audience mainly thinks that the ports are the are the, are the big problem, so that ships are becoming too big for maybe too small ports. How, how, how would you address or <laughs> this okay, well, I, I, outcome? I think let me start off first by saying that um, I'm, uh, we're obviously very excited to see these huge growth rates that you refer to. But I think before we rush to uh, make um, you know, pronouncements, we need to put everything into perspective. The perspective is that cruising is a very young industry, and it is infinitesimally small. I mean, only 25 million people went on a vacation on a cruise in a year when 1.3 billion people go on a holiday in a year. So in a relation of how many people go on holiday versus cruising, it's, it's very, very small. I always uh, keep saying that um, if, you correct me if I'm wrong, if all cruise ships which exist today, deep sea cruise ships, on the oceans, if they all are operating 100% occupancy rates of full for one year, it's still a little bit more than the half of what Las Vegas alone has to digest um, per year. So it's really, on one hand, a very tiny industry. Exactly, yeah. precisely yeah. my point. So within that context, if, if, if that's the start rate, then we should be expecting people and the growth rates to continue growing as we start educating people as to what cruising represents as a form of vacation. So I think that, you know, if you were to look out in the future, uh, the growth rates will continue. And they will be continue to be pretty impressive. And in fact, I would go so far as saying that the cruise industry is actually believes in itself because they have actually placed phenomenal orders for cruise ships. It's history making. We have right now in the order books in the European shipyards more than 90 cruise ships to be delivered between now. From an existing fleet of from about an existing 300, 300, there's an additional yeah. 90 yeah. that will come and be delivered by the year 2025, 2026, which means doubling of the capacity. Let's assume that that doubling of the capacity was completely full. It means we'd go from 25 million people to 40 million people. Still small. Still not Las Vegas. <laughs> Still small. Still not Las Vegas. <laughs> so, as a consequence of that, the next question then is, well, really, it's the ports that are the problem. And I, I don't know if the ports are the problem. Certainly, the perception of what happens today in the cruise environment is it would make you feel that ports are the problem because you see ships coming into these ports and in Europe, the, the big difference between Europe and the rest of the world is our ports in Europe are in the cities and our cities and our continents are old cities. We've been around for, for hundreds and hundreds of years and therefore ports cannot grow like they do in the Caribbean and in new places where they go and build infrastructure far, far away from the, from the town. Or build and even be, islands. Uh, and even build islands. Yeah. You know, for us in Europe, the port is fabric of the society. It's part of the community. And that's where they are. And therefore, you see these ships coming in and you say, well, we can't grow. But then, if you were to sit down and have a look at how many ports do we actually visit, I can guarantee you that I suspect m not more than one-third of the ports that are available in Europe are actually visited by cruise lines. I take my country, for example, in, 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 uh, in Greece. Um, you, I think everybody knows that in Greece, you predominantly go to the, to the islands. Greece has 3,000 islands, 140 are inhabited, and for the past 30 years, only six destinations have been on the cruise itineraries. And I'm sure most of you can even answer who they are. Mykonos, Santorini, Heraklion, Rhodos, Kadakolon, Paris. Bingo. You know, this is not the beginning and the end. There's another 140 islands out there that could be ports. I don't think the ports are the problem. Yeah, but I mean, 
we, we, are, we are calling this, we, we call this, uh, this session cruising in a shrinking world. So um, the problem probably as, as, as I could see it, or the audience maybe see, sees it, is that we have more and more big ships, and these big ships are more having to, to, to share the same ports. I mean, if you're looking at Venice, if you're looking at Dubrovnik uh, or Barcelona, for example, all these big ships are not able anymore uh, to use ports like Istanbul, uh, Egypt um, is, is quite down, Tunisia, North Africa, so they are all changing to the Western Med, and as the ships are getting bigger, uh, the ports are also fewer where they can go in. So how would you see the problem that if these very um, big ships are sharing the infrastructure of the very same few ports, more and more ships are going in? Because you said the small, the small ports, of course, they are wonderful for smaller ships like you have. But what about the big ships? And we have so many big ships also in order with up to 7,000 guests and 2,000 crew, 9,000 people. Yeah. Well, I, I, as you say, there's, I think there's two different dimensions. The, f the one that you've said is ship size and port facilities, how do you handle that? Um, there are sufficiently enough ports to handle these big vessels, but what cre clearly needs to be worked out is logistics to ensure that not all the ships arrive at the same time and logistics within the city in terms of the infrastructure. Let's face it, the cruise companies go into ports and those ports being in a city have to deal with many, many tourists, not only cruise tourists. Tourism is growing everywhere. So airports, um, train stations, bus stations, bus facilities, roads have to be improved, the infrastructure. And this is something that I think every single community in the European uh, countries understand and that's part of it. And the second thing is, at some point in time, and already it's happening, you know, cruising, being such a young industry and being so new, it's about choice. And I, I give my company as an example. We have made a decision, we have a belief that we do, will never get into big ships because precisely of the choice that we want to bring. We want to go to all the ports that others cannot get to. We want to retain the size of the ship to be what we call humanely. What I mean by that is personal service, that uh, you don't feel that you're a number, that you can go ahead and do it. It's, so there's different choices, and it's, it's like the car industry. Are all the cars SUVs and big? No, you have the small cars, and you have the big cars, and you have the medium But, but you have, cars. we have more and more big ships, and you're representing at CLIA also those companies. But, but equally, what you have, you have also more new type of cruise companies coming up. So, for example, the number of orders that have come in for expedition type of ships has gone from a zero base to whatever it is. Last two years, it's really a real year. rally we exactly. are experiencing with the small expedition ships. Exactly. Yeah, right. so, yeah. so what I'm basically saying is, in a young industry which is gone, the big ships have actually make a lot of sense from the cost efficiency point of view and being able to attract people to come to a form of vacation where it's relatively lower cost. And then you have different operators like ourselves and like, who have smaller ships where maybe the cost might be slightly higher, but give you a totally different experience and take you where the others can't. It's, it's a bit of everything. And I don't, I don't even see the other companies as being my competitors. They're not. We have to go out, all of us in the cruise industry, and educate people as to why cruising is an alternative form of vacation. And people, consumers at large, go to the internet, they do their research, they start making their choices, and then and the, the most important thing is provide them the choice. And this is where we come in. This is where smaller Provided companies come in. Provided the people are getting the information what the choices are. I think this is a very, I think, important point because the big companies with the big ships, they have marketing tools, they have a budget, a very much more budget than small companies. So I think, I um, don't know whether you, you, you share my view, um, one of the most important things, education, you said, Educating the travel agencies also, educating the media, uh, whoever is transferring the message of what cruise can be, that 
all those people, all the stakeholders involved are knowing the differences, are knowing that, for example, there is also a, a, um, a company called Celeste Cruz existing. Your marketing budget is much tighter than one, for example, of MSC or Costa or AIDA, just name it, I mean, the, the big ships. How can you provide this, this knowledge, this education that all the people who would be interested in, uh, in, in getting uh, this, this choice are really also getting the information about the existence of such companies? Well, you know, it's, it's the perennial question. In any industry that you're in, you'll have bigger players who have more money and who can do things much easier, and you have smaller players. We're a smaller player. We just have to be smarter, we have to be more efficient, and we have to do things in a, in a different way to what others are. So, for example, for us, we know that a huge part of our um, education program is to work very, very closely with travel agents and tour operators. And if you look at the large companies, they don't work so much with tour operators, they work on a direct basis. So the channel of distribution is very much different. So we have a much closer cooperation with tour operators, tour travel agents. We give them more commission. So th there's a different way of attracting it. Um, equally, I think, proportionately speaking, we spend more on inviting journalists as yourself and other journalists, travel journalists, to come onto our vessels so if you were to break down how we spend the money and where we allocate the money, we do things in a different way to the large. Proportionally large. more, Proportion, more exactly, money for, yeah. for that. And spreading the direct Spreading it out, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, that's, so I think that that's, that plays a, a, a huge role. I mean, I would, um, I would probably venture a guess that if I s chose a number of tour operators in every single large country and said, and once they know us, and who do you prefer working to? Do you prefer working with a Celestial or one of the larger ones? Probably they would say they prefer working with us because we are more flexible, we give them better commissions, and we provide them more information. And it's a more that's personal a relationship, probably. Exactly. And, and, and that's, that is good. That's good for the industry because it makes everybody sharper in what it is. I would love to get to the situation where I have so much demand that I can go and charter my own plane and fill it up but that probably will take me 10 years. Until that time, we will continue doing what it is that we do. And, and again, it's important. I think that you know, uh, the, the perception that are travel agents, that individuals come up with their own desires of what they want to do, makes it very important to have alternatives like us because people can make their choice. And once they know the choice, then it's easier for them to make the decision where to go. But nevertheless, you're representing, as clear chair of Europe also, the big players. Yes. And, and what are you telling them? Uh, do you think it is realistic? Is it really realistic that um, you can put competitors on one table uh, and let's say that they are really um, coordinating their port calls, that if company A is want, wants to to call Barcelona, company B, the competitor is not going there. Is that realistic? Or is, is there not a certain danger that um, the cruise companies, they will just do what they want, pretending cooperating, but not really cooperating, <laughs> that they will also be a victim of their own success right now? Uh, well, th that's a very good can question. Can you put I mean, them on the same table? And, uh, can, I, can we put them on the same table? The answer is yes. You can put everybody on the same table. And you have to have the ability of um, sitting and discussing not on personal corporate terms, but what is right for the industry. Let's face it. If the cruise industry cannot sit down and discuss about a problem of congestion in a port, Collectively, we will sink because the industry and the reputation of the industry will get affected and perception of people will get affected and they don't think about in company terms. They don't think about Carnival or Royal Caribbean or something. No, the whole industry it's, as it's such. It's cruising, think, cruising. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, you know, we're, we're everybody in the, every company is pretty pragmatic, realistic and, and, and logical. So we understand that there are certain things which have to be done for the good of the industry, and we sit and we talk how, about how the best way to do it. Um, it's, it you know, the collaboration with ports is hugely important. It's not up to the cruise line. I mean, the port doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the city. It's a port. It's a different entity. 
we have to sit and talk with the, with the port and then with the community at large and saying, here are three or four things that we need to do. Congestion, port facilities, security, opening up shops. And together, by speaking with these people, you have the changes. So, you know, there is a, I think there's a wrong perception because in our minds, there are certain ports that seem to be bigger than their reputation. So, you mentioned Venice, uh, Barcelona, and things like that, which are very, very big. In Barcelona, are, it, it, this, is, this is a big city. Hamburg is a big city. Big city. But, for example, Dubrovnik, this is a very famous example always. Dubrovnik is uh, one old town with one main street, and we always hear also from critical uh, um, yeah, media, I think they're right also to, to, to put emphasis maybe on, on this phenomenon that if three, four cruise ships, uh, each with two, three, four, five thousand passengers, it's simply not possible anymore uh, to digest this over tourism in a, in a way, maybe in a healthy way, where the local uh, inhabitants can also take advantage of the business. Because yeah. if they think that the cruise business is like, uh, like an octopus, uh, and uh, taking over all those um, all those towns. I think this is the perception sometimes uh, for, from, from some people. And here I think coordination will be very important. Coordination is very important. And, and again, you, know, you gave me that example. I'll give you a different example. Um, we go to ports, and in Greece we opened up new ports that nobody has ever gone to. And I can guarantee you since we've done that, I have 50 new ports asking me to go there because they realize how good it is for their economy. So there's always pluses and... and, and but the big and ships are not able to the call Big those ships are not no. there, but yeah. you know, the, the, the question is, do you have... It's not all or nothing. There's things find a balance, and the big ports will eventually build it to a certain size. The companies themselves will recognize that they can start having alternatives and developing new ports. So. If you look at the port of Barcelona, there's a lovely port right next to it, the port of Tarragona, Tarragona yeah. which you can easily start going to and you start having choice. But do you think that one of those new buildings with 7,000 passengers, I mean, provocatively a little bit, yeah. but are going to Tarragona instead of Barcelona? I Is that I, realistic? I, 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 let me answer you differently. <laughs> a few years ago, you, you told me that you went and saw a newly built ship which was, went, I think, from maybe 500 passengers to 1,500 passengers. And he said, ah, this is huge, it'll never grow. So, you know, we put, we put our own barriers in our minds, and we think that this is it. Society and systems and, and business finds its way of managing these things. So I'm a fervent believer that 20, 30 years, we didn't even think about the size of these vessels, we didn't even think about the ports, yet we've done it. We've built it, we've done it, and we are managing it. Yeah. In 10 years' time, when somebody else will be sitting here and asking probably the same question, probably on the map, they'll be, instead of talking about five ports, we'll be talking about 15 ports, and there'll be more. That's the nature of growing a business. Um, to give you another consideration, who in our right minds would have thought that 15 years ago would be holding smartphones? Nobody knew about it. You know, society grows, and we, we overcome our problems. We find do solutions you, to our problems. Do you know how, how old the iPhone is? Yeah. You're ten years. Uh, yeah. Ten, before, we didn't have any apps. Yeah. Can yeah. we imagine a life without apps? No. Well, I mean, we can't. <laughs> you're right. You know, yeah. uh, so, so I think that, you know, we, and I keep on coming back to the same thing. We're only 25 million. There is huge opportunity for growth, and the industry is always at the forefront of innovation. Just like now you see a, a raft of large vessels, I, if I was to predict and I had to put money down, I'll say to you that the next generation of vessel orders, you'll start seeing more smaller sized vessels and even smaller as you proliferate. So the diversity exactly. of, of uh, vessels, vessels, of, that's right. of experiences exactly. are. Yeah. Do you think that um, it could be also one day um, be a reality that uh, ports are selling slots like the air like the airports are selling uh, time <laughs> slots now that's being very provocative you know i don't put it past <laughs> the ports they're a business they're a business i mean you know the ports are in there to make money 
the so airports, airports as well. Airports are but are still, they are, they, they, they are overcrowded sometimes, so they have to contribute, or the, the airlines right. are owning <laughs> slots and they are selling and their slots selling again. Their Do you think something like this could happen in the cruise industry? It could very well happen. I mean, I, I don't never say never. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is that business finds a way of dealing with these things. And if it comes to being a prohibitive cost, then you go somewhere else. So that's why I fervently believe that you, what you will see over the next 10 years is as the cru cruising is here to stay, the cruising industry has invested more than 50 billion in cruise ships. They are going to grow this business as a form of vacation. As a consequence of that, more ports are going to get into the business, more suppliers are going to get into the business, more forms of vacation are getting into the business. It's a reality. And more communication within the industry right. in, in, in incorporating exactly. uh, and, and coordinating exactly. will be, will be, you know, will I be mean, important. You know, the cruise industry does not exist by itself. We, we don't do everything. We are, a, we are a, tr uh, um, a vehicle that transports people with a hotel, gives them a great time from point A to point B, and the point A's belong to other people, so everybody has to work together. This is, this is collaboration. And this is also your role, I think. It could that, that you, want, you want to, to extend this, 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 uh, this culture of, of collaboration. Competition, okay, yeah. very important, but still co cooperation and collaboration is, is very essential. much needed. It's needed more than maybe ever. It's, it's, it's collaboration it always exists. Needs. Always exists. The question is that the time has come for the cruise industry to go out openly and educate people about everything that we do. And it means that we educate society at large at what we do, make people understand that we are investing a lot of money, we're leading technology, we are very, very, uh, uh, we're a good corporate citizen. We, um, we certainly support the European economy to a huge extent because 95% of all cruise ships are built in Europe. And that means that you know, Europe has a benefit to, to continue having cruise ships here because of, of the, all this money that goes into the economy. Local economies in tourism benefit from that. You, you know, restaurants. Well, there are, there are different studies here. I mean, sometimes you hear also that, uh, okay, the cruise companies are owning their own terminals, their own shops, uh, and the local um, inhabitants, they have nothing. Uh, others than, than maybe the rubbish uh, the cruise guests are leaving behind them and uh, the money is going all in the pockets of the cruise companies. I mean, what, how would you address to this criticism? Uh, I, you know, I, I, I hear with it with, and, I, and it puts a smile on my face. It's certainly not you nothing know, new to you. It's not nothing that. new. I mean, you hear that, you know, God knows what we will hear. All I can be is very practical and very uh, realistic. I know for a fact, and you'll speak to any of us, that when we go, we pour we pay our poor taxes, we work with local restaurants, the taxi drivers love us, the guides need us, the museums require us, uh, you, you name it, we have it, the shops work with us. Yeah. Will there be some parts of the world that a cruise line goes and builds an island in order to entertain? Yes, if there's no choice, because you know, you're keeping people. But would they do it in Europe? No, because there's so much choice in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we cannot be, it's not black and white. There's, there's room for everyone. And the reality is that cruise companies are a huge benefit to the economies wherever they go. Otherwise, we would have closed. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the law of a liberal economy. If you don't like me, if you, we don't offer something, you close me down. Brings me to the second question. We have prepared a second question. Right. Maybe we can change a little bit the subject. And uh, talking about security, we don't have so much time anymore. But five minutes, we can talk about the security situation. I think a lot of people are really interested in. Uh, um, especially as, as you are here, um, being the CEO of a company, as I told, mentioned before, um, operating also in Turkey, for example, many people are avoiding Turkey right now. And um, yeah, you've seen the question. What one, two, three? <laughs> let's see. Let's see what, uh, what what is what is going to happen. Was the wrong slide? Is there no second question? 
Okay, let's improvise. No second question, but we have questions, and we don't have so much time anymore. But um, speaking about security, I think you are in a very special situation that uh, you are um, operating um, cruise ships also in Turkey. What do you have to say to that? I okay. mean, <laughs> are people not afraid going to Turkey? Are you not suffering enormously about it? Or okay, let, I, I, let me answer the question. We operate ships, and... and Ships uh, can go anywhere. Uh, our home country happens to be, we're a, a cruise company that has its operational base in Greece, and our uh, primary objective is to bring passengers from all over the world to the Greek islands and to Greek destinations. One of those markets that's very close to us is Turkey. Turkey has a population of 17 million people. Greece has a population of 10 million people. Together, it's 80 million people. The potential of the population is as big as Germany. Now, if I was to turn around and, since we're in Germany, and ask anybody here, say, who do you view as your cruise line? You will say to me, it's either TUI, or it's AIDA, or Hapa Gloyd, at least those three, and you would consider those as being your cruise lines. Well, everybody has the same right, and if you ask a Greek, who, which is your cruise line? We hope he says Celestial Cruises. And if we ask Turkish people, which is your cruise line, we hope they say Celestial Cruises. So we continue to go to Turkey because for us, it is part of educating and growing Turkey as a source market. And hopefully one day, there'll be as many Turks going on a cruise, two million, as there are Germans going on a cruise. So you are regarding uh, Turkey not as a destination market in the it's a source market. It's a source market. market right. right. And then when you look at our itineraries, the itineraries that we have, it is predominantly taking people to see Greek destinations. Now, because this particular year, at this particular point in time, there is a sensitivity around certain destinations in the world, and one of those sensitivities is Turkey, we have shown flexibility in our itineraries that whoever chooses to come sailing with us and does not wish to go to Turkey, we have made a stop in an island called Samos, Everybody can, who does not wish to proceed can disembark in Samos. We carry on to Kushadasi. We do, for those that want to go to Kushadasi, the tour. And we take Turks on our vessels. On the way back, we stop again in Samos. All those people have had a great time in Samos. They get back on the vessel and they carry on. So we provide flexibility and choice. And that way we are able to provide the security factor and the comfort to somebody who does not wish to go somewhere that he's not going there, but at the same time, we're continuing to But that's develop. an interesting point. So you regard uh, Turkey as, as, a, as an, in, an interesting and important source market. Absolutely. Yeah. And, in, and to that extent, we have invested heavily. Um, three years ago, we had zero Turks cruising with us. Last year, in the time of the crisis, we reached uh, just under 40,000. Uh, and this is in a short space of two and a half months. Okay. So, I mean, you know, I think that the same thing, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you went to Spain, probably you wouldn't have had more than 50,000 Spaniards going. So it takes time to develop market, and we are going to develop Turkey and Greece in addition to what we're doing. Kerry, we could go on for hours, and um, time is flying. Again, thanks very much for being here. Thank and, you for um, having me. For being our guest. And um, yeah, let's, let's move to the next panel. Thank you very much. Which will be an environmental aspect, which will also be interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kyriakos Anastasiadis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting interview. And what we learned is according to the product life cycle model, Cruise tourism is still in the expansion phase with all typical characteristics, as we heard, for example, the size of the ships. So thank you once again. We'll have a short break before we will continue with the last uh, keynote, the Outlook keynote, and the topic will be destination branding, creating desire for travel.